Good morning. I am looking forward to Christmas, though I have no shopping done. How about you guys? Um, we are doing kind of a women who saved Christmas theme, though it's not just women this time. I am reading today from the book of Ruth, some verses from the first chapter. I decided not to read the whole of the first chapter because there's a lot going on in the service today. So I'm starting in the sixth verse, but jumping around a little. So if you're trying to follow along, it's going to jump um, a couple of times in here, so it might not flow quite perfectly. Um, hear the word of the Lord. When Naomi heard in Moab uh, that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. When her, with her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the land on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant each of you... May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I were to have, were, if there were still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for you, me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Naomi replied, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and where there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, may it be ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley wheat harvest was beginning. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this God's holy word. Amen. Sometimes I describe Ruth as the woman who saved Christmas, but that might seem a little strange. She lived 1,200 years before Jesus, and she was of the wrong race. She was living in the wrong land, and she was a widow. How could she possibly save Christmas? The tale of Ruth and Naomi begins in a tragedy. Naomi and her family departed the land of Israel for foreign parts because of a famine. While they were there, her boys married two local girls, Ruth and Orpah. Then tragedy strikes again. All three of their men folk die. Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah are left widowed and childless. They have no hope, no future, no place in a society that depended on men to provide for their womenfolk. The famine has ended, but not for Naomi and the two girls. Um, Naomi still has some kin back home in Bethlehem, which is literally the house of bread, and she decides to return. Both of her daughters-in-law decide to go with her, but she warns them that she's merely going home to die. She urges them to return to their own people, and Orpah reluctantly goes back. Ruth, on the other hand, makes one of the deepest and most profound statements of human love in the Bible. It's not a story about sexual love, like the Song of Solomon. Rather, it's a pledge of something far more profound. 
In the Good News Bible, which is not the one I read this morning, it reads this way. Don't ask me to leave you. Let me go with you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and that is the place I will be buried. May the Lord's worst punishment come upon me if I let anything but left, death separate you from me. Many couples often choose to have those words read at their wedding, usually in the King James, and I'm going to read that one too. And treat me not to leave thee or return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, and those are the words we're used to hearing, I will go. For where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more so, if aught but death part thee from me. The words in the Good News and the New International Version are certainly a more accurate rendering of the meaning of the Hebrew. However, they lack something of the flavor. The language is too casual for what Ruth is doing here. This is not just some girl making an offhand promise. This is not a teenager or even a young woman making a promise. Instead, it is a thought-out decision. Ruth is making an oath. It's a solemn promise, a pledge, as binding as any we might swear today in front of a judge or at the wedding altar. It's more binding than most of the ones we swear. You can't go to a judge back then and get this one erased. You can't go to court and get a divorce from something like this. It follows an ancient formula we call a covenant. Whatever their relative power, Ruth is placing herself in a subordinate position to Naomi. She is appealing to Naomi for permission to stay. Then she becomes bold. She is making a promise that nearly half of all American marriages fail to live up to. She is promising a permanent and utter faithfulness. She is promising to bind herself, to follow, to stay with Naomi forever. And she makes that pledge on the condition that God will utterly destroy her. It actually says die-die, um, which is their way of making it a superlative. They don't have ERs or ESTs. They add to the end of words. They repeat the word a number of times to make it mean more or most. If she, so it, she says, may God utterly kill me, kill, kill me, if I fail to live up to this promise. It is a promise which the rest of the book will show she delivers on. Will, at the end of the book, Ruth will be described as better than a dozen sons to Naomi. Ruth will be praised by the man she marries as faithful to Naomi beyond any doubt, beyond even that of any ordinary Jewish woman. Terry Tempest Williams says of this, the, Ru the book of Ruth honors the loyal bonds between women to care for one another and it reaps the harvest of love. Ruth's empathy and toil gives birth to authentic power as a result. It is the bond of empathy and hard work that endures in the story. Ruth becomes the embodiment of ideals that are usually seen as feminine virtues. She is willing to put it all on the line for someone else, not because she expects praise or merit, but because it is seen as a task that needs doing, care, compassion, and empathy, and choosing the necessary over the glamorous. These are all things that have historically been seen as women's work. Both Boaz and the other women in Bethlehem will use praises that describe Ruth as the helper of Naomi. 
The language there draws us back to the beginning chapters of Genesis when God created humans, first Adam and then Eve. God's decision to create Eve is described with these words, It is not good for man to live alone. I will make a suitable companion to help him. That's in the good news. And the word that the good news translates as companion is more accurately rendered as helper or the King James old archaic word helpmeet. The good news and the King James and the NIV undoubtedly chose those other words, helper and companion, because of the unfortunate associations we often have with the word helpmeet. Um, those words are often seen as denoting someone lesser. It's the sidekick. It's Robin to Batman. They're meant to be the subordinate, the one who's supposed to be in the shadows. The helpmate is supposed to be and reflect all praise back on the one who should be out in front. But there are better examples of what it means to be a helper. Tolkien said that it was Sam who was the true hero of the Lord of the Rings. And he surely had this model of Ruth and Naomi in mind when he modeled Sam and Frodo's friendship. Sam was the one who, ne who helped. He was the one who never gave up, even when everyone else did. Sam climbed a tower filled with orcs to rescue Frodo, fought a giant sp spider when he thought Frodo was dead just so that he could give Frodo decent burial. It was Sam who took every step of that dark journey, believing that they will succeed, even when Frodo gave up. And it was his belief that hold, held Frodo on his course when Frodo didn't think he could make it one step further. And in that final mile, Sam carries Frodo when he can't walk, because the path has become too hard. Tolkien was a devout Christian, and so it shouldn't surprise us that this is the model of faith and friendship that he chose to be the centerpiece of his story. It was key to his faith to understand friendship in that way. But it was also a key element of the biblical understanding of God. God chooses this very word for our relationship with God. It's not the word for us. It's God's word for God's own self. It's not a common one, but in both the Psalms and the prophets, God is described as the helper of Israel. Just this one example might give you an idea. The psalmist is in trouble and says this, proud people are coming to attack me. Cruel people are coming to kill me. Those who do not care about God, but God is my helper. The Lord is my defender. This is the God who chases after us in trouble, who digs in and does the arduous work when we cannot. This is the God who promises us to help when we think we have been abandoned, and who, like Sam, will stand against all comers to defend us. When we are grouchy as Naomi was, this God will plead with us to come along on the journey. When we think we're going to die, this is the God who promises to come with us into death. Perhaps like Naomi, you're feeling afraid or concerned that things are changing just too rapidly. Perhaps hearing about the church's finances or the fact that you're getting the sermon by recording. Perhaps whatever it is in your life right now has you upset. Consider that God has promised to come alongside you to be the exact kind of helper you need, like Ruth was to Naomi. If you still wonder how Ruth says Christmas, consider her bloodline as well. She was the mother of Obed, the father of Jesse, 
the father of David, and hence of David's descendant, Jesus. More than, even more, she embodies the virtues of this God who was born in a major 1,200 years later. She is persistent, full of empathy, and willing to companion someone she loves, even when everyone else abandoned you, her. So when you come to the manger, hear the king of the universe, born as a tiny baby, say to you, as Ruth spoke to Naomi, beg me not to leave you or return from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And where you live, I will live. Your people shall be my people, for I am your God. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we come before you this day asking for your help and companionship in this time. We ask that you will be with us, and that you will be our comfort and our source of strength, uh, that you will be with us when we do not know what to do. When we feel alone, remind us that you still shine a light in the dark. Hear us as we pray for those we love. We ask, O oh God, that you will come close to them and comfort them in their grief, in their sorrow, in their confusion. Heal those that need to be healed. We thank you that Jan is able to get around a little bit better. We ask, O oh God, that you will be with those who are struggling to understand what is going on in the world. For it seems like in the midst of a season that should be filled with light and joy, sometimes the lights are going out in places where war has turned up the fervor of hate. We pray especially, O oh God, this day for places where bombs had stopped and have now started again. We pray for Israel and for Palestine that they might come back to the table and find a way to bring peace to that war-torn land, one that lasts not just for a day, but for all time. We pray, O oh God, for the hostages that are still held in both sides of that war-torn place. We pray, O oh God, for the people of Ukraine and Russia who still fight more than a year after they first exchanged words and bombs and have stolen children deep in the heart of a land where they do not speak the language. We ask, O oh God, that you will bring them home. We pray for people who are living in places where gangs rule and guns shoot deep into houses. We ask, O oh God, that you will bring peace to those lands and towns even in this country. We ask, O oh God, that you be with those who are homeless and cold this night. For you know, too, the sting of what it is to sleep where there is no shelter. Hear us, O oh God, as we pray for those in need and for ourselves and all that is needed in our lives. We ask that you will hear those prayers that we say now with the words that you taught us to say, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Now, I will not preach next week, but I'll be back in two, and then I'll be up. So I will see you in person in three weeks, or four weeks, whichever that is, how you want to look at that on the calendar. Have a good day.